The cathedral's doors swung open, and a man rushed in, announcing someone's arrival. He approached the blonde man, his face filled with fear, worried that the place was no longer safe and they needed to escape. The blonde man asked, who is he? The trembling man informed him of the bone-chilling rumors circulating in Humite Street about the lichen slaughter, the vampire slayer, or the master of the blue devils heading their way with his undead, determined to prevent the Dark Order from escaping and intent on executing them in the cruelest manner. The mentioned boy strode forward with an air of mystery, a vast army of undead at his side, each of them reaching out with their hands. He calmly reassured the others that there was no need to be afraid since they had the finest holy knight order with them. The man, now even more frightened, revealed that the knights he had spoken of were turned into undead and were advancing toward them. The hooded boy menacingly led the army of the undead, and the knights followed his lead, their hands radiating a powerful, glowing light, compelling the undead to charge at the cathedral. As the two conversed, the undead soldiers closed in on the room, and both men watched in astonishment as the glass in front of them cracked with a purple glow. The undead launched their attack, and the knights raged at them, biting and tearing their flesh, leaving them battered on the floor. The blonde man wondered how it could be that the undead, who should have been their allies, were now serving the boy. He was startled as the boy approached him. The old blonde man clenched his teeth with contempt as he recognized the boy. The boy continued, claiming that no matter how hard the old man tried to stop them, God would grant them salvation. When those words left his mouth, the boy aimed his rifle at the old man's head and stepped on him. The old man felt divine power seeping into him, and his eyes welled up with tears as the boy's face radiated in the moonlight. The boy declared that the blessing of God would lead the old man to hell and used his rifle, enchanted with the same powers he had used to control the undead, resounding with a bang as his powers were released. People in the palace gossiped about the seventh prince who had been exiled, calling him the shame of the holy emperor's kingdom. They went so far as to say he was the worst kind of person with no morals, and they recalled an incident when the archbishop's daughter had been harassed by the prince, which got him into trouble. They thought it would have been better if he had accepted his punishment, but instead, he chose to vandalize the archbishop's room by splattering red paint on the walls and calling him Gaia's slave. This incident angered the holy emperor, who then banished the prince to the land of the dead spirits to reflect on his actions. Even in this distant place, the prince got involved in more trouble and attempted suicide after being rejected by a girl. He was fortunate to survive, and this experience changed him completely. He began working diligently at the monastery, without causing any more mischief, and suddenly, he became the center of everyone's attention. However, some people remained suspicious of him, wondering how he had transformed so dramatically in such a short time. The townspeople assumed that a demon had entered his body because of his past blasphemy, or that he had made a pact with a demon. Some even claimed to have seen a corpse at the monastery, spreading many baseless rumors. The zombies stood there, their eyes lifeless, staring at the astonished prince. A blue screen popped up before him, displaying his name as Alan Alfels, 16 years old, and a member of the necromancer class. Annoyed by its repeated appearance, Alan closed the screen. He explained to the zombies that people might have seen them walking around the monastery, leading to suspicions that he might be a heretic. He sighed, thinking back to his surprising reincarnation as the Holy Emperor's son, Alan Alfels. In his previous life, he had been an average person living in the Republic of Korea. Alan pointed at the status windows visible to him, revealing his necromancer abilities that had helped him become a graveyard keeper, all of which were considered heresy in this land. The zombies appeared puzzled by his random dances and explanations. Alan admitted that he had been confused at the beginning, but he had grown used to this life. He wondered if he should stop doing this job. He looked at the zombies, appreciating their help in grave digging and burying the corpses while all he did was place gravestones on top of the finished tombs. He blissfully expressed his gratitude for their company, making the zombies feel touched. After that, he mentioned that they had to part ways now, causing the color to drain from their faces. The zombies threw a tantrum, disagreeing with Alan. He elaborated that he wanted to live his second life more peacefully, and a positive radiance surrounded him. The zombies protested and Alan reassured them that he would think about it since he had grown close to them. He then urged them to start working as the sun dawned upon the monastery. Two masked people huffed, pulling a cart, their faces filled with fear, not wanting to meet the same fate as the two men on the cart they were dragging. They hurried to find the prince to ask for his help with the cursed village. As soon as they mentioned the curse, the door to a nearby house creaked open, reeking of blood, and a single eye with a red iris peered through it. Alan inspected the bodies and asked if these were the last of the corpses. The men, sweating with fear, confirmed, looking at each other nervously, explaining that everyone had fled, leaving the village filled with lifeless bodies. 
They implored Alan to come with them to the village. Alan turned to face them, asking why he should do that. Distraught, the men informed him that nearly the entire village had been wiped out, and they believed they would be safer if they were with a prince. One of them added that they might have been spared because they had frequently seen Alan while bringing the corpses. Alan didn't quite understand how a mere prince could possess such powers, but hesitantly agreed as the men continued their incessant begging, recognizing that there was some sort of misunderstanding. They cautiously entered the spooky-looking village, and as the waterworks had stopped functioning, Alan ended up stepping into one of the water pools. The two scared men clung to him as if he were their protective charm. As they searched through the houses, they came across something suspicious. Alan decided to investigate, but the other two protested. He sensed a simple but malevolent presence in the house and cautiously advanced. Suddenly, a sharp, shrieking sound echoed behind him. Alan turned around to find it was a little harmless rat, but it was soon revealed by his glowing eyes and abnormal tongue, it was not just any rat. A horde of a thousand similar rats followed, all charging at him with a strange bloodlust. Alan was startled as the zombie rats climbed onto him, and in a moment of panic, he swung his shovel, hitting the zombie mice. The force of his blow unintentionally channeled his necromancer powers, instantly killing some of the mice. Alan was taken by surprise by this unintentional display of power and struggled to defend himself from the now vengeful mice. They climbed onto him, ready to attack, while the shovel in his hands began to glow blue once again, charged with necromancer energy. He and the shovel fell into the puddle. Realizing he needed to put an end to this, Alan used his necromancer skill to turn the shovel and the water into his weapon. He whirled the water, creating a swirling vortex that entrapped the zombie rats. A screen displayed his skill, which he dubbed the Swamp of Death. The two men who had brought him were astonished by the large number of rats and the transformation of the water into holy water. They assumed that Alan had purified the rats because he was the prince of the Holy Kingdom. As Alan recovered from this revelation, he concluded that the Holy Emperor's grandson's body contained holy powers that had transformed his necromancer skills into something holy. This also explained why the zombies were relatively kind to him. He felt his reflection appearing as the holy necromancer due to the holy blood of the prince. Drenched and startled, Alan's attention turned to a girl who exclaimed that she had expected them all to die, but now there was a boy. The two men recognized her as Charlotte from next door and asked about her parents. In the midst of their small talk, Charlotte suddenly held a shiny knife and charged at the men with bloodlust in her eyes. Fortunately, Alan managed to avoid the knife with his shovel, realizing that since she was using tools, she might not yet be a zombie. Alan saw the girl weeping, calling out for her mom and dad. He swiftly blocked Charlotte's next attack, using his holy power to repel her, and he realized that his holy power burned the zombies' bodies. Not wanting to harm the girl, he made a difficult decision. He pushed Charlotte into the puddle of holy water he had created earlier, assuring her to endure it since he had no other option. Charlotte struggled for a moment before submerging in the water, her eyes weakly spacing out. News of Alan purifying the group of rats that had invaded the village and saving people from Charlotte quickly spread through the village. The villagers entered the monastery seeking Alan's help. Alan closed the book he had been reading and calmly claimed he had never saved anyone, stating that Charlotte had died. He turned to the people and said he couldn't save anyone because he was only related to the Holy Emperor and lacked any special abilities. The people looked disappointed, asking how they were going to save the village now. Alan looked at them, distressed, and inquired who had told them that he had saved anyone. Suddenly, a man burst through the door, calling out to Prince Alan cheerfully, informing them that Charlotte was okay, all thanks to Alan. He mentioned that he had put her back to sleep since she seemed tired. However, he stopped abruptly when he realized the group of people were looking at Alan with contempt. Getting up, Alan gave up his facade and decided to help the people since he possessed more divine power than most, but he presented a few conditions for his assistance. Alan read the screen before him, revealing the identity of the 75-year-old man named Parlock, who possessed various skills like tattle, farming, and tricks. Suspicion filled Alan as he thought that Parlock might be suspicious of him, given Alan's reputation as a trashy prince. Alan presented a simple condition with a grin. He asked for money and supplies for his work and offered to fix the cathedral for free. Initially hesitant, the people readily obliged after Alan pointed out that it was a matter of life and death unless they preferred the alternative. They also agreed to keep this fact confidential from the Holy Knights. Alan smiled, thinking that the cathedral, initially meant as a place of exile, would now serve a useful purpose. Parlock informed Alan that thirty corpses in the village had become zombies. Alan urged everyone to grab their weapons, catching the villagers off guard. 
He clarified that he wasn't going to fight alone and explained that they could swing their weapons while he performed his holy prayers. Seeing his confident grin, the people began to murmur, suggesting that he might be some kind of demon. Amidst the chaos, one of the villagers discovered that they were already being followed by the zombie. Alan rushed them to grab their available weapons. As the evening fell, the zombies advanced toward the cathedral, and Alan asked the chief how he had only counted 30 corpses, receiving an excuse in response. Alan and the villagers fought against the zombies. Alan used his skill, the Swamp of Death, creating a whirlpool of holy water to attack the zombies underwater. During the battle, Alan revealed that using the skills wasn't the hard part, as he had been a necromancer in a virtual reality game's beta testing before his reincarnation. He explained that he had died due to electrocution and lost consciousness when he smelled his burnt skin, after which he found himself in someone else's body. Fortunately, the skills from the game had transferred with him. Now, the challenge was controlling his divine power, which kept spilling out every time he used a skill. He wondered if this could be fixed. In the midst of the battle, a man struggled to fight the zombies as he saw his wife among the horde. Unable to continue, he referred to the zombie as his wife and couldn't fight anymore. The zombies he identified as his wife approached him, gently touching his tear-drenched cheeks and suddenly lunged at him with a shriek. Alan swiftly intervened, landing a kick on her face to make her fall before she could attack the man. The man exclaimed, Honey, in response to the zombie being thrashed on the ground, but Alan sternly told him to stop overreacting since she was already dead. He aimed the shovel at the woman's rotten body. Her lost soul trapped there aimlessly. Alan urged the man to put her to rest if he didn't want her trapped in that decaying form. As they were about to proceed, the zombies charged at Alan. In the midst of the chaos, he noticed something unusual suddenly. A girl punched down on the ground, appearing out of nowhere, with her white hair flowing around her. It was Charlotte. She stood up and asked the prince if he was okay. The autumn and winter had been seasons plagued by sickness. Charlotte believed it was all happening so she could stay healthy next year, just as her mother had told her. However, when she returned home, searching for her parents to inform them about the red-eyed rats invading the village, she came face to face with her father's rotting corpse, taken over by the zombies, chewing on her mother's neck. The room was smeared with blood, and her mother's teary eyes told her to escape, saying her dad had already turned into a zombie. Trembling, Charlotte stepped away as both her parents transformed into zombies before her. She couldn't recall much after that. Charlotte tried to escape the plague-bearing rats and her own parents reanimated bodies chasing after her. She grabbed whatever weapon she could find and swung at them. The low growling of the zombies slowly faded, and she hid from the apocalypse happening outside. People in her village had become strange, and she could no longer muster any hope. The rats that had previously tried to eat her no longer did so, and she realized she was slowly turning into one of them. She grew pessimistic, believing that it was unlikely anyone could save her now. She wished that just one person could rescue her from this helpless situation. Her memories drifted to the day Alan had submerged her in the holy water and saved her. She woke up from her slumber, sweating and heaving profusely, unaware of her surroundings. Noticing she had gained consciousness, a maid checked on her and informed her that the prince had asked her to take care of Charlotte. She was urged to stay quiet since there were zombies outside. Not fully aware of everything that had happened recently, she peered through the window and saw the prince urging the people to fight. She witnessed the zombies approaching Alan from behind and remembered the helplessness she had felt when no one could come to her rescue. She jumped out of the window, ignoring the maid's protests, and landed on the ground where the battle against the zombies raged. After confirming the price was alright, she decided to save them all on her own. He was astonished to see a group of zombies in front of him, all defeated by her. The villagers began to cheer for her and worship her. Alan felt relieved, thinking that purifying her right before she turned into a zombie had an effect. However, he started to worry because he didn't even know what his own abilities did. Alan then approached the villagers and encouraged them to take care of their deceased family members. He informed them about a ritual for the deceased and wished for their spirits to rest peacefully, preventing them from wandering. After the funeral ended, he went to bed feeling restless. The next morning, he woke up to the sound of villagers talking. As he looked out the window, he discovered that the zombies had kidnapped someone, which shocked him. The villagers chatted about the recent kidnappings by the zombies, claiming to have seen it with their own eyes. They revealed that the zombies took advantage of the fact that the villagers were exhausted after working all night. Suddenly, a voice yelled from behind, pleading for help against the zombies. The two men told her to wait, and Alan inquired about who Morian was. The men explained that Morian was the lady who gathered herbs and helped treat injured villagers. Alan asked if he knew her, 
and the men nervously mentioned that she was a beauty who had rejected Prince Alan's confession. Alan grew disheartened upon hearing the same story and stopped their explanation. The men suggested forming a search party to find Morian. Alan realized that these men were favoring her because of her beauty and decided to get involved since it was his first time witnessing a zombie kidnapping a human. He asked the men if tracking was possible, and they mentioned a hunter named Sir Hans from the village. They departed after Alan asked the men to call him for a rescue quickly. Alan noticed Charlotte staring at him and suspected if she held a grudge against him, so he rushed to Morian's rescue, leaving Charlotte at the scene. With the help of Hans, they quickly found the zombies' traces, as they walked by dragging their feet. They entered a cave, and Alan stood before the entrance, shovel in hand, sensing the ominous energy. He believed the place was either full of zombies or the source of the plague itself. Alan assumed that this place was unlike others, with a natural accumulation of demonic energy, and judging by the actions of the zombies, someone must be controlling them. He suddenly suggested burning down the place, despite the fact that Morian was still inside. Alan informed the others that it would be fatal for everyone to rush inside to save a single woman. He suggested they prepare properly and revisit the place, even though the possibility of Morian's survival would drop. Suddenly, a zombie bear growled behind him, bearing its sharp canines and biting at his shoulder. The people grew scared and called out to the now injured prince. Alan collapsed on the ground, realizing that the bear was also a zombie. The bear walked up to the cliff and hurled him off it. Alan yelled in the air and used his shovel to activate his skill, the Swamp of Death, using the water to bring him back to land. He also unlocked another skill, the Terrible Curse, and used it to heal his injured shoulder. He realized with disappointment that his necromancer skills had been reversed, having an opposite effect, but it proved convenient during moments like this. Alan studied the zombie bear with the help of his ability. The bear was called the King of Gluttony and had specialties like biting, crushing, slashing, and digging into organs. Its state was enhanced by necromancy, which explained why the bear had held up well even after being hit by holy water, making it tougher for Alan to defeat. As the growling bear lunged at Alan again, someone intervened and slashed the bear's eye with a sword. Charlotte stood atop the bear with a sword buried deep in its eye, causing blood to pour out. The bear slowly collapsed. Alan looked surprised, wondering if Charlotte had followed along. And he asked her to hold the bear, catching her off guard. This allowed the bear to thrash Charlotte on the ground, cracking the rocks behind her. The bear then charged at her, mouth wide open. Just as the bear was about to bite, Charlotte plunged a knife into the roof of its mouth, drawing blood. At that moment, Alan used his ability to knock the bear off and sent it flying into the rock beside him. Charlotte sighed, sweating from the close encounter with the bear. Alan thanked Charlotte for her intervention, and she thanked him as well. However, when she saw Alan's extended hands appearing rotten, she suspected that Sir Alan had also turned into a zombie. Zombies began rising from the ground around them. Alan gave a devilish smirk as the zombies emerged and exclaimed that the other necromancer had no chance with the number of zombies they had. The zombies then bit into the flesh of the King of Gluttony, eliciting painful grunts from the bear. It clawed at the zombies' faces with its paws, sending them flying into the rocks behind. More zombies emerged from the underground, and Alan seemed exhausted after summoning more and more zombies to defeat the zombie bear. The bear tore into the rotten bodies of the zombies, displaying its durability, but in the end, it fell with a thud to the ground, its entire body oozing blood. Alan found the outcome predictable but felt dizzy from the effort. Charlotte called out to Alan, asking if he was okay. He assured her that he was okay but had used up too much of his divine power. Alan wondered why Charlotte was there and asked her to keep quiet about all the power of his she had seen. He claimed he wanted to live peacefully as an exile. Charlotte was charmed by his request, even though Alan meant to not bother her anymore and didn't want to be bothered either. Charlotte expressed her willingness to listen to any of his wishes because he had saved her life. Alan didn't entirely agree with that narrative, but he was interrupted by the people who called out to them. The villagers entered the cave with their gear and expressed concern for Alan and Charlotte. Hans climbed down with a rope, although Alan secretly didn't find the preparation helpful. Han asked if they had defeated the zombie bear, and Alan informed the people that there was probably a necromancer in the cave, making it a base for the creation of zombies. He lied, saying that all the zombies were already dead when he and Charlotte arrived. The men bought Alan's lies, and he thought about Morian, who was probably dead by now. He realized that the necromancer had lured them into the cave to be killed by the bear, using Morian as bait. Alan told the people they would go further into the cave to see how great of a necromancer the person inside was. As they explored deeper into the rocky cave with sources of water, they found a little puddle of water. 
The people hid behind a rock as one of the men showed them Morian tied up, with a few scattered papers before her. The two walked up to her, claiming they had come to her rescue. Alan found it surprising that she was alive, suspecting yet another bait by the necromancer and questioning Morian. Morian looked at Alan, calling out to him and trying to appear harmless as her eyes welled up. But Alan suddenly struck her in the mouth with his shovel, drawing blood and catching everyone by surprise. Alan claimed he should have hit her with the sharper side of the shovel as she collapsed on the ground. The other men checked up on her, questioning the prince's actions. Alan revealed the screen that showed her true identity as a 63-year-old Morgana. Her specialties included honey trap, necromancy, dissection, curse, and assassination, and her current state was extremely nervous and agitated. Alan realized that Morian was not just a bait. She shivered as she tried to explain there must have been some misunderstanding. But Alan quickly revealed her true identity as a necromancer, surprising the men. Morgana tried to play innocent and make them believe lies. But Alan quickly cut her off, testing her honesty with the holy water in his hands. He revealed that if a necromancer drank it, it would melt their organs, but it was the best medicine for a human's wounds. Morgana tried making excuses, but Alan pressured her into drinking it. Growing paler by the second, Morgana recalled her year-long disguise as Morian, who was kind to everyone and was not suspected by anyone. She questioned what powers Alan possessed that allowed him to see through her disguise and defeat the overpowering zombie bear as well. Alan teased her, saying she should have received the holy water gratefully, while she muttered menacingly under her breath that she had planned to kill him during the wave of death, letting go of her disguise. She used her powers to crash the bottle on the ground, spilling it, and the skeletons rose from under the earth, appearing possessed by the necromancer's powers. Morgana turned to her original form and announced the prince's death was now hastened, and he was to die there. Alan used his shovel to strike the skeletons on their skulls, telling them to go back while he was still saying it nicely and not to act arrogantly before him. Just as Morgana was caught off guard by the unexpected events unfolding, Charlotte struck her from behind. Morgana blabbered in confusion, wondering how Alan had been able to control her skeletons and whether the shovel itself was the source of his strength. Alan jokingly confirmed, and Morgana actually considered his shovel must be a holy relic. Alan brought her attention to the fact that she herself was in danger as Charlotte held a knife at her neck and that she didn't need worry about something else. Morgana stood bruised, her hands bound, and was forced to admit her real identity, breaking the hearts of the villagers. She pleaded with Alan not to kill her, promising to reveal who had ordered her to assassinate him. She admitted that she was sent to seduce him and disguise his death as a suicide, revealing that the prince was forced into suicide and wasn't as pathetic as he seemed. Morgana wondered why the prince was so indifferent about his own death. Her lips quivered as she revealed that the Dark Church had sent her to assassinate the Holy Emperor's seventh grandson. She further revealed that she could tell he was also a necromancer through the bear, and if the church learned of this, they would not leave him alone for long. Realizing that Morgana had seen his powers, Alan announced that they needed to decide her fate. Charlotte held the knife at Morgana's neck again as she pleaded not to be killed, promising that she wouldn't let her tongue slip and would reveal everything about the Dark Church. However, Alan slapped her across the cheek, saying that if the truth was so easily revealed, then it wasn't worth much. He left the decision to the villagers, mentioning the deaths of their family members due to her actions and saying that she should pay for her sins. As Morgana kept pleading, Hans decided that she should be given a punishment fitting for the crimes she had committed. He suggested a painful death, leaving her body in the forest for the animals to devour, with the remnants becoming a zombie, a fitting end for a necromancer who insulted the dead. Alan remarked that it was quite a brutal punishment, as expected of the Middle Ages. As he looked at the setting sun, he thought about the dark church and, away from the eyes of his companions, pulled out piles of books he had acquired from the necromancer, storing them in his inventory. He pondered the possibility of talking to spirits and began to search for information about the wave of death and the assassination, suspecting that his siblings might be involved. Alan found the idea believable, considering his status as a prince and the potential power struggles within the royal family. He closed the book and contemplated the challenges of royal life, particularly the risk of being assassinated in a power struggle. He resolved to raise his proficiency skills quickly. Unbeknownst to Alan, Charlotte was sitting at the benches of the cathedral, overhearing his earlier exclamations. She reflected on the abrupt change in Prince Alan, how he used to take initiative in fighting despite his size, and how he saved many people and held funerals for those who had passed away. She remembered that Alan had also taken care of her parents' corpses while she was unconscious, and it moved her to tears. She considered him both her savior and the savior of her parents. Watching Alan sitting at the window, Charlotte felt the need to thank him but realized that mere thanks wouldn't be enough. 
She recognized the danger surrounding him and decided that she needed to become stronger to protect the prince. With an iron-like determination, she picked up a book called The Imperial Swordsmanship Guide, resolving to become even stronger and protect the great prince who sat at the window, seemingly playing nonchalantly. Alan learned from the Book of Necromancy about the different evolutions of the undead, starting from zombies, who would turn into skeletons as their bodies decayed. However, if their bodies remained intact, they could evolve into stronger forms, such as ghouls, Delahan, and eventually vampires. With each evolution, they became more intelligent and powerful. These undead creatures sought out areas with strong mana, and the ultimate destination for them was the land of the dead spirits. To prevent their flesh from decaying in warm weather, they migrated to darker and colder regions, and the period when their instincts were at their peak was known as the Wave of the Dead. December 25th, Christmas Day, was the coldest day of the Wave of Death, the day when the King of the Undead, Ammon, died, and it was also when the largest number of undead sought out the land of the dead spirits to reclaim their lives. Closing the book, Alan contemplated that there was still a month until the Wave of Death arrived, and the witch was planning to use the zombies to kill him. Charlotte appeared before him, offering to help put the book back on the shelf. Alan acknowledged that Charlotte had been coming to the church even without him asking for it, and she had been diligently organizing books, cleaning, tending to the cemeteries, and preparing meals without expecting payment. He felt a bit uneasy but assumed she would leave when she was satisfied. He also thought about Grill, who had adopted her and provided her with a home. Interrupting his thoughts, three holy knights walked up to the cathedral door, catching Alan by surprise. Alan acknowledged the news of Morgana's execution accompanied by Harmon's informality. Alan asked if they had any issues with it. Harmon continued by confirming other reports about Alan defeating predators with his farming tool, while a man named Grill killed thirty zombies and cornered the witch with holy water. Alan realized that they had been keeping tabs on his activities. The knights relayed the information to him, stating that it was what Farmer Grill had told them. It was the same person he had been praising just five minutes earlier. Initially, the knights found Grill's account to be an exaggeration, but as they observed the traces of a fierce battle, the commander became convinced of its truth. Curious, the commander inquired whether he knew that Morgana was associated with the Dark Church. Alan revealed that she had personally confided in him about her affiliation with the Dark Church. The commander proceeded to disclose the Dark Church's malevolent nature, citing that Morgana had already devastated five villages on her own. The startling revelation left him stunned, as he had been fooling around while knowing this. Alan then asked if he was aware that Morgana had been beaten to death, and her body disposed of. In response, the knight asked if Alan was involved, to which he swiftly denied any involvement, realizing that revealing his powers could land him in trouble. Instead, he decided to rely on Grill's bluff and the villagers' support. He feigned fainting, recounting how he was so terrified that he had nearly wet his pants just by being present. This revelation disgusted the knight. The knights inquired about the missing books from the witch's shelf, which was the primary reason for their mission. Alan played coy and claimed that the villagers might have burned the books due to their ominous nature. Satisfied or perhaps unwilling to press further, the knights decided to take their leave. Before departing, Harmon handed Alan a bag of 80 gold coins as a bounty on Morgana's head. Though Alan was astonished, he agreed to distribute the reward among the villagers, secretly elated that he had obtained both the books and the gold. As they prepared to leave, the knight surprised Alan by instructing him to pack his belongings, stating they would escort him out before the impending wave of death. Alan was astonished that they still cared about him, given his status as a prince. Clutching the bag of gold, Alan asked the knight about his destination if they were evacuating. The knight revealed that he would be sent to the Lonia estate, which was half a day's journey away but still within the land of the dead. Alan inquired about the benefits of being at the Lonia estate to which the knight explained that it was a fortress built to combat the wave of death. It housed soldiers and prisoners gathered to fight against this impending threat. Harmon somberly suggested that there would be victims of the wave and asked Alan to arrange funerals at the Lonia estate. Upon their arrival at Lonia, Viscount Jennard Lapping warmly greeted Alan, asking how he was feeling and if the journey had been rough. Alan, feeling unwell and uncomfortable, replied honestly. He couldn't help but feel that they were being treated kindly for someone in exile. Viscount Lapping then inquired about Charlotte and Grill their identities, prompting Alan to demand that he be shown to his room. Alan couldn't help but wonder why he had been brought to Lonia, this beautiful estate covered in snow. As the story unfolds, it is revealed to the readers that Lonia Estate had earned the nickname Sacrificial Fortress. It was strategically situated in the land of the dead spirits, where the victims who would appease the wrath of the deceased were gathered. 
The castle walls that encircled this land served the sole purpose of blocking the wave of death, and the people within were expected to endure for a month against the hordes of zombies before they could experience the arrival of spring after observing the line of prisoners and soldiers being taken somewhere. Alan couldn't help but ask Harmond if they would be on the front lines. Harmond agreed and suggested that Alan could assist by healing injured soldiers, sharing the staggering statistics of two to 3,000 casualties that occurred every year. This revelation left Alan feeling solemn, and he inquired if there were others who would join him in this task. Harmon assured him that he would be accompanied by 80 priests capable of performing purification rituals, and the soldiers would also help with the funerals. He further explained that there were individuals who succumbed to exhaustion and overwork in this dire situation. Despite the gravity of the situation, Alan's lively response surprised the feudal lord, as he requested some drinks, explaining that he couldn't handle the situation without them, stating that he'd rather face the prospect of dying from excessive drinking than from working too hard. What lies ahead for them as they venture into this mystical world? What do you think will happen next? Don't forget to hit the like button, comment if you want to continue this series and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.